It was the empire that shaped Europe, the seat of emperors, of legions, of Roman blood, or so we thought, because beneath the marble ruins, beneath the ashes of time, another Rome is whispering to us, one not written in stone, but in DNA. When scientists first pried open the ancient graves of imperial Rome, they expected to find Italians, sons of Latium, heirs of Romulus, but what they uncovered was a genetic map no historian had drawn. Fewer than 30% of the city's people carried native Italian roots. The rest traced their ancestry eastward, to the Levant, to Egypt, to Anatolia, to North Africa, a city of a million souls. Yet most were from lands the Romans had once called foreign. So what does that mean to be Roman? When your body carries one identity and your passport another? Picture it, a Roman forum bustling with merchants, mothers, soldiers, speaking Latin, practicing Roman law. But in their veins, bloodlines from ancient Phoenicia, from the sands of Syria, from the olive groves of Greece. Identity wasn't simple. It wasn't pure. It was layered, tangled alive. And the stones of Rome kept their silence. Until now. Because in these fragments of ancient bone, buried beneath centuries of myth, we are finding truths that history forgot. If you're fascinated by lost histories and ancient DNA mysteries, subscribe now. There are so many more stories waiting beneath the surface. But this is just the beginning. Because the deeper question is not where these Romans ended up, it's where their story began. And to answer that, we must go back. Far back, before the empire, before the city, before Rome was even Rome, before the empire, before the city, even before the legend of Romulus and Remus, there was only land, and ice, and shadow. Twelve thousand years ago, this place we now call Italy, was not yet Italy. It was a raw, wild world, forests tangled with mist, mountains scarred by the retreat of glaciers, and the people who walked it? Hunter-gatherers, lean, silent, living by bone and arrow. For millennia, their footprints alone marked these ancient soils. But then something shifted. From across the dark waters, boats appeared. Not warriors. Farmers. Carrying not just seeds, but something far more potent. A different kind of inheritance, etched into their DNA. They came from Anatolia, what we know today as Turkey. But hidden in their genes was a signature no one expected. Iran, a deep, eastern lineage, threaded through this migrating wave. A quiet twist in the story of Europe. As these early farmers settled, the land itself transformed. Wild grasses bent beneath wheat. Forests gave way to fields. Stone tools became polished, ceremonial. But it wasn't only the earth that changed. The people did, too. The ancient hunter blood was diluted, reshaped. Their descendants now carried a new genetic mosaic, part local part Anatolian, part Iranian, a forgotten fusion, beneath the olive groves and vineyards we romanticize today. Imagine it, a woman planting barley beneath an Italian sun, her ancestors once nomads of the Iranian plateau, her child, neither wholly one nor the other. This was the first great genetic shift of the peninsula, but it would not be the last, because soon, across the vast grasslands of the north, another force was stirring, and their arrival, would not just change Italy. It would redefine all of Europe. They came from the horizon, not by ship, but by hoof, across the endless grasslands of the Pontocaspian steppe, modern Ukraine, southern Russia. Waves of riders surged westward. Warriors, wanderers carrying no flags, no written words, only their horses, their weapons, and their blood. And that blood would change Europe. For centuries, these steppe nomads had lived in the saddle moving with the seasons, with the herds. But sometime between 300 and 1000 BCE, they pushed beyond their ancient frontiers, into the heart of Europe, into the Italian peninsula, not as conquerors of land, but as weavers of lineage. Their DNA, unmistakable, bold strands of steppe ancestry now visible in ancient Italian bones, superimposed upon the earlier farmer lineages of Anatolia and Iran. A new blend was taking shape, one that would ripple across history. But this was more than genetics. The steppe riders brought with them language, Proto-Indo-European, an ancestral tongue that would fracture and flower into most of today's European languages. Latin, Greek, Germanic, Celtic, 
the words we speak, the myths we tell, echoes of those ancient writers. And yet not all was erased. In Italy, the Etruscans stood apart, a culture of enigmatic beauty, their language stubbornly non-Indo-European, a voice from an older world. But when their bones were tested, an astonishing twist. Their DNA was soaked in steppe ancestry. How could a people adopt the blood of the newcomers, yet preserve a language from before the migrations? It was not a conquest of identity, but a fusion. And by the time Rome's legendary founders would walk the hills of Latium, this land, this people were already a genetic mosaic, a tapestry of farmers, herders, warriors, and ancient tongues. Which begs the question, when Rome was born, who truly were the first Romans? The year is 753 B.C. The moment Rome is born, or so the legend says, a shepherd's son, a she-wolf, a sword in the soil. But beneath this myth lies a far stranger truth, because when modern scientists unsealed the graves of Rome's earliest citizens, they found no single Roman bloodline. Instead, fragments of a deeper mosaic, in bones older than the Republic, older than the Caesars, DNA whispered a hidden story. Traces of Anatolian farmers, Pontic steppe riders, ancient Levantine merchants, and something even more startling. One burial, a woman, Etruscan by culture, her grave rich with bronze and ivory. But her genome? Over 50% North African ancestry. How? Why? Centuries before Rome ruled the seas, ships were already crossing them. Phoenician traders weaving routes from Carthage to Sardinia. Greek sailors mapping strange coastlines, and with them people, stories, blood. Rome, even in its infancy, was a port, not just of goods, but of genes. Picture the markets of Latium, olive oil beside incense, bronze alongside scarabs, foreign tongues mingling with early Latin. And in this swirl, a new kind of Roman began to emerge, not defined by lineage, but by place, by belonging. The city's future diversity was no accident, no gift of empire. It was seeded in its soil from the very first stone. But as Rome's ambitions grew, as it reached beyond the Tiber, another force would soon reshape its identity once again. Conquest. And with it, waves of blood from every corner of the known world. The Republic was young, its ambition boundless. From a city of seven hills, Rome began to reach outward. First, the Latin neighbors. Then the Etruscans. Tribe after tribe fell beneath the Roman standard. Assimilation by sword, by treaty, by marriage. And in these early conquests, the bloodlines remained close. Italic peoples, cousins beneath the skin. But then came the ships. To the south, Carthage. To the east, Greece. And suddenly, war was no longer just a matter of land. It was a matter of people. The Punic Wars unleashed a tide of captives. Carthaginian men and women, chained, sold, absorbed into Roman households. Their children would bear the features of two worlds. And after the conquest of the Greek cities, another flood. Greek philosophers, artisans, teachers, many enslaved, some freed, all carrying something invisible, woven into their descendants' DNA. In the homes of Roman elites, the Greek tutor for the sons, a Carthaginian nurse for the daughters, a foreign lover behind the marble colonnades. And so, the blood of Africa, of the Levant, of the Aegean, seeped quietly into Rome. Yet on the Senate floor, the rhetoric was clear. Rome was superior. Rome was pure. But in the streets? A different story. A city of shifting tongues, of blended faces. And a question, whispered more often with each passing year. Who truly is Roman? An identity was forming one that could no longer be traced simply by blood. But the Republic's wars were only beginning. Soon, the legions would march beyond the seas, into realms untouched. And what returned with them would blow the gates wide open. The dawn of empire. Rome, no longer a republic of farmers and soldiers, now a capital of an empire. One million souls, the largest city the ancient world had ever seen. But beneath the marble facades, the triumphal arches, the strange pattern was emerging. Archaeologists exhumed dozens of skeletons from the height of imperial Rome, and what the genomes revealed defied every textbook. Out of 48 individuals, 
Only two carried the genetic signature of old Italic blood. The rest came from somewhere else. The Levant, Egypt, Anatolia, North Africa. The city had become a living map of empire. Walk the forum, and you'd hear Greek spoken as often as Latin. Follow the scent of spices, cinnamon from the east, saffron from distant shores. Grain ships from Alexandria fed the city's masses. Artisans from Anatolia crafted marble statues for Roman villas. Syrian archers guarded the northern frontiers. Some retired to Rome, their children born beneath the Capitoline Hill. And with every merchant, every soldier, every slave, came blood. Blood that mingled, shifted, transformed the very genome of the city. Rome was no longer a city of Romans. It was the world in miniature. And for those living within its walls, an uneasy question lingered. When your city belongs to the world, who are you? But even as this question echoed through marble corridors, the empire's reach kept expanding. And the roads that carried its legions carried something else. DNA flowing, crisscrossing, stitching together lands that had once been strangers. Across an empire of stone roads and sea routes, people moved. But just how far no one imagined. Until now. New DNA research has traced the buried dead of the Roman world, and 8%, 8 out of every 100, came from somewhere else entirely, far beyond the land where they now lay. A Roman-era grave in Austria holds the bones of a North African. In Britain, along Hadrian's Wall, skeletons of men with Saharan ancestry, and in central Italy, a burial dated to the 2nd century carries a genetic signature from the distant east. An ancestor who once walked the Silk Road, whose blood now rests beneath Italian soil. This was not the slow drift of ancient migration. It was fast, immediate, legions marching across continents, merchants chasing profit from Alexandria to Londinium, diplomats, artisans, slaves, freedmen, all moving through an imperial machine of roads and ships. The empire's veins pulsed with human movement, a kind of mobility we once thought modern. And yet, here's the paradox. With all this movement, bloodlines flowing from Africa to Britain, from Syria to Gaul, you'd expect a genetic blur, a melting of differences. But that is not what we see. Despite the crossings, despite the mingling, regional genetic identities remained. Strong. Distinct. Why? How did an empire that connected the known world fail to erase its ancient boundaries? The answer lies in the spaces between people in the choices they made, of who to marry, where to settle, when to return, and in what happened when the roads began to crumble. Empires do not fall in a day, but sometimes they begin to unravel in silence. First came the plagues, waves of death that emptied the streets of Rome. Then the borders cracked. Invasions from the north, the Visigoths, the Vandals, the Lombards, and as the legions thin, trade faltered. Roads, once pulsing with life, grew quiet. Grass crept through the stones. The empire fractured. And with it, so did the city. Archaeologists have traced the DNA of these dark centuries, where once the genomes of Rome shimmered with eastern threads, from Syria, from Egypt, from the Aegean. Now they shift. Back, toward Western Europe. New blood flows in Gothic, Lombard, Frankish lineages, layering over what came before. A reversion, a narrowing. The great cosmopolis that had drawn the world to its heart was becoming smaller, less global, more provincial. The empire's fall was not just political, it was biological. A shrinking of horizons, a loss of the vast, tangled genetic web that had once defined Rome. But it did not vanish. Not entirely. Beneath the new layers, beneath the Germanic influx, the medieval reshaping, some traces remained. Faint echoes of an ancient, impossible city where North African, Greek, Syrian, and Italian blood once mingled freely. And as we now look deeper, with modern tools, those echoes are still there, waiting to be heard. Because while the empire fell, its genetic crossroads did not die. Centuries have passed. Empires crumbled to dust. Marble worn thin. Road swallowed by earth. Statues faceless, but something remains, not in stone, not in ruins, in us, modern Italians, especially here, in Rome, and across the southern lands, 
still carry whispers of that vanished world. DNA threads, woven through time. A blend of Mediterranean and Levantine blood, echoes of the empire's greatest reach. A fragment of an Egyptian merchant. The shadow of a Greek artisan. The pulse of a Syrian soldier long buried, yet alive in the cells of their descendants. And with every new study, we see it clearer. The empire is gone, but its genetic web endures, and perhaps it always will, because identity is not fixed, not pure, not simple. It moves, it twists, it blends, just as Rome did, and that may be the true legacy of empire, not the stones, not the statues, but the marks it leaves in our blood. So I ask you this, what if every empire leaves behind not monuments, but a living imprint, inherited? invisible, carried forward through generations? And if so, what other ancient empires still shape us today? Stay tuned.